Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for March 18th, 2024. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers known as microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is sponsored primarily by Adafruit, so one great way to support uh, folks like me who get to work on CircuitPython is to buy your hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. Although there's stuff going on 24-7 in a bunch of channels, we hold this meeting in the CircuitPython Dev Text channel and the CircuitPython Voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes document, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming messages via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. Before the meeting, you can uh, add to this document your notes. And uh, once we post up this video and podcast, we will have a link to the finished notes document along with timestamps, so you can switch, uh, skip to the parts of the meeting that interest you the most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes, um, so we find it's valuable to have that option. Then after the meeting, we'll post a uh, link to the next meeting's notes so that anytime during the week you can add your hug reports or status updates. And as always, if you uh, wish to participate but can't attend, uh, you can also add your notes to the document at any time and we'll read through them when we get there. Okay, so the structure of this meeting, we've got five parts. We'll cover community news, the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Then we'll open it up to the community to give us hug reports, status updates, and finally discuss any topics that are in the weeds. And with that, I would love to tell you about some items from the newsletter. I picked just a couple of items from the community newsletter put together by our very own Ann Barella every week. Uh, first off, the headline story, CircuitPython 9.0.0 Release Candidate 1 Released. This is a release candidate for 9.0.0 Final. The release is believed to be stable and is meant for testing before the final release of version 9.0.0. And there is a link to the full list of new and updated items in the blog as well as the release notes. Second up, I picked uh, the next story as the project of the week, an uptime indicator. A Pac-Man Ghost Light serves as an indicator for Uptime Kuma, a self-hosted monitoring tool. An ESP32C3 monitors and displays status with colored NeoPixel LEDs. After prototyping with CircuitPython on a Raspberry Pi Pico W. And there are some links to Reddit and GitHub. And then the last item I picked out is Custom Flight Sim Controllers with CircuitPython and Mobi Flight. And there is a link to an Adafruit Playground. This was our featured story from the Adafruit Playground a place where you can put up information about your projects, made with CircuitPython or not, made with Adafruit parts or not. It's a great way to share um, your stuff and you don't have to administer a website or anything like that. It's free when you have an Adafruit account, so check that out. And now about the newsletter itself. Uh, the Python on Microcontrollers weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash circuit python. The newsletter highlights the latest Python and hardware related news from around the web, including circuit python, python, and micropython. I called it a community run newsletter, and we love to uh, get submissions from the community. You can do that in several ways. You can uh, submit either your own project or somebody else's by editing the draft on GitHub and submitting a pull request. You can also email cpnews at adafruit.com. We also try to follow the hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or X, formerly known as Twitter. And that wraps it up for the newsletter, but a big hug report to Anby for putting it together every week. Thanks so much. Next, we move on to sort of a uh, numbers-based overview of the health of the whole project called the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Our friendly bot Adabot gathers information from approximately the previous seven days up to the early hours of the morning Eastern time. Um, so that means a lot of stuff, is, if you did something today after the sun came up, it's probably not in this report. Overall, across the whole project, 
we saw 29 pull requests merged from 21 authors, which is an enormous number. Um, some names that I don't recognize are Guts, G-U-U-T-Z, Leland Sint, uh, Jins T. Komoda, and uh, Anonymous Cowhead, there's a fun name. Um, and I also want to thank the six reviewers. Those uh, look like they're all Adafruit people, but um, if you want to hear a little bit more about reviewing and helping out with the project that way, uh, Tim will be telling us about that in a few minutes. But now uh, I'm going to ask Scott to tell us about the core. All right, thank you, Jeff. Okay, so for numbers for the core, we had 18 pull requests merged from 12 different authors, which is awesome. Um, some less frequent folks, ADCC, Jens Tukmoda, uh, James Denau, Goots, Bill 88T, uh, Andy Bing are all, and Lady Ada are all infrequent contributors, so thanks to them. Um, I ha we had three reviewers, including infrequent reviewer maker Melissa, so thanks to Melissa for doing some reviews in the core. Uh, we have 24 open pull requests, so we're just under the 25, which is great. Um, and a few of those we should be able to get through as well. We had 29 closed issues by five people and six opened by five people, so we're net down a lot, and I think that's thanks to Dan going through some old issues. Uh, we have a total of 656 open issues. Uh, we have nine active milestones. We use milestones to prioritize uh, the work uh, for Adafruit-funded folks, so um, if there's other things that maybe I've marked long-term, feel free to work on that. We're happy to help you work on it, um, but it's not a priority for us eight different funded folks. Um, we have zero open issues for 8.2x. We have two open issues for 9.0. Those are probably tracking issues. Uh, and then we have three open issues for 9.0x. Um, those are the top of mind issues right now because we're trying to get 9.0 out the door and we'll talk about that in the weeds later. Um, we have two open issues for 10.0 and we have 20 one open issues for 9xx, things that we'd kind of like to do in this 90 series, uh, or this 9x series um, over the next few months, maybe. Um, we have one issue not assigned a milestone, so we'll have to take a look at that. And otherwise, uh, that's it for the core. Thank you, Scott. Next up, Tim will tell us about the libraries. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this section will cover all of the Python level Adafruit libraries, uh, which are all found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library it is. Uh, these things are typically either like uh, driver libraries for specific pieces of hardware or higher level helper libraries that make it easier for you to uh, create your project without worrying about as many of the low level details. Uh, across all those libraries this week, we had eight pull requests merged by eight authors. Um, the uh, name in there that stuck out to me as perhaps newer or less frequent contributor was Leland Sint. Uh, so thanks to them and thanks to our other more frequent uh, contributors or folks with names that are more familiar to me at least. Um, we had uh, five reviewers this week, mostly the usual folks, but thanks to uh, Scott, Dan, Tectric, Liz, and myself for reviews this week of the eight uh, pulled, eight um, merged pull requests, rather. The oldest one was 15 days, and the newest ones were just one day, so mostly on the newer side this week. That leaves us, after the week, with 55 open pull requests. Uh, the oldest one is 571 days, the newest one's one day. The uh, Over the past seven days, we had six issues that were closed by five different people and six new issues opened by five people, so uh, net equal there on issues. That leaves us with 740 open issues, of which uh, there are 19 of them that are labeled good first issues, which you can find over at circuitpython.org slash contributing, uh, which is where you should head if you are interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things. Uh, on that page, you'll find a list of open PRs and a list of open issues. Um, if you're looking to contribute, that's a great place to start. Um, if you're interested in reviewing, you can check out the list of open PRs, take a look at the code. Uh, if you've got the hardware for it, you can test it out. Otherwise, just look at the uh, syntax, the spelling, etc. Leave a comment letting us know that you looked at it. And once you're comfortable doing that, we can uh, get you leveled up to the official review team. 
Uh, if you are interested in uh, actually getting your hands dirty to do some coding, you can look at the list of open issues. Um, there is a drop down there to sort by labels on those issues. So if you're looking for those good first issues, you can uh, filter based on that or uh, one of a number of other labels. Once you find an issue you want to work on, you can go and write the uh, code for it, create a PR and get that submitted in GitHub. If you need help with any of that sort of stuff, we've got guides about contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, uh, as well as a lively community here on the Discord of folks who are more than willing to help you out. So if uh, that is something that you want to do, but you feel like uh, you need help with that, please uh, check out the guides. Come join us on the Discord. Uh, there are plenty of folks that would love to help you get um, spun up so that you can contribute. Uh, in terms of the library PyPI stats for the week, we had 117,506 PyPI downloads over the past, uh, excuse me, over the uh, 325 total libraries that there are. Um, the top 10 list is here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look through that. And the uh, updated libraries in the past seven days, uh, it lists here as uh, OAuth 2 and template engine, although. It does occur to me that the list of merged PRs includes a few others, which probably got releases as well. So I don't know if those stats are accurate now that I'm uh, saying them out loud. But that's what we've got for libraries this week. Thanks. Thank you. And to round out this section, Melissa, can you give us a rundown of the numbers on Blinka? Yeah, uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry, for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had, uh, yeah, last week, uh, we had three pull requests by uh, two authors and one reviewer. The, uh, there are currently six open pull requests amongst all the repositories. There were two closed issues by one person and zero opened. Uh, they're leaving a net of uh, 83 open issues. There were 12,496 PyPI downloads in the last week. 11,775 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and it says we're at 129 boards, but I had add, actually added three uh, last week, uh, so it should be 132. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Melissa, and thanks again, Tim and Scott. And now it's time for everybody who is interested to participate with the round robin section known as Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. And of course, if you're text only or have to miss the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. All right, so I will start and then the next couple of people are Dan and DJ Devon. I have a group hug and I also want to give a hug to Scott for a quick chat before the meeting. Turns out we have a shared interest in choral music and got to chat a little bit about that. Um, and also a hug for Adishapu for a neat uh, PNG decoder that is in the stage library. It's limited to 16 color bitmaps, so it can't just grab PNGs from the internet or whatever, but it is still a cool showcase of what you can do with CircuitPython. And all right, Dan, what do you have this week? All right, so um, thanks to Praxis Code for noticing USB host pin power problem on Team C. That's fixed for 90 final. Thanks to Jerry for noticing a typo when trying to disable ESP camera on the Matrix Portal S3. That's fixed. And thanks to uh, Taylor U, ADCC, and TAC for fixing the a tricky um, RP2040 serial. Uh, USB bug, which caused disconnects in certain cases, um, that's fixed for 9.0 final. It involved a lot of looking at tra USB traces and understanding the details of USB hardware. And thanks to Jeff and Scott for the past few weeks fixes to 9.0, which is, have brought it to final after there being dozens of bugs. So thank you guys very much. Okay. Thanks, Dan. And next up is DJ Devon 3 Hi. Hello. Thank you. 
I have, I have a lot of people to thank this week because I've had a busy week. Uh, thank you to the developers for the 9.0 RC1 uh, release this week. Or a hug, I'm sorry. A hug to the developers. Uh, a hug to Brent Rebell for the encouragement to continue investigating the ATEC crypto chip bug, um, which I'll go into later. Uh, a hug to Foamy Guy for help with getting pre-commit commands to work with GitHub Desktop. Uh, a hug to Dan H for teaching me more about Git branch management and a bunch of excellent advice, which I promptly ignored and then took his advice and improved my life. Uh, to, a hug to Anik Data, LP Cannon, and Justin for Python interesting Python syntax discussions. A uh, hug to P. Raya on GitHub for making myself and reviewers aware of a year-old commit that was approved but never merged. It was a minor syntax PR update, so nothing major. It was just weird that it was just never merged. Uh, a hug to Justin and Dan H. for holding my hand, walking me through uh, Git issues on a Sunday night. And a hug to Foamy Guy for reviewing four of 11 adequate request PRs I submitted over the weekend. There are a total of 12, I promise. And I got 11 done, but I swear it will end at 12. Uh, thank you. All right. We love we love big numbers, though, so I think it's fine. Um, all right, I'll read notes from David, and then after that we will go to Foamy Guy. Uh, David writes, a hug to Foamy Guy, C. Darius, and James J. Nadal for... Con contributing to support the M5 stack card pewter and its keyboard, a hug to retired wizard for supporting the card pewter in PyDOS and card pewter REPL, one for Dan H and Tanut for review and support to integrate the card pewter, and soon the multiplexed key matrix keyboard in 9.0, and to me for all the keyboard upgrades to the USB learn guides. And uh, all right, Tim, you're up next, and then it is Jerry. All right, thanks. Uh, my hug reports for this week, thanks to Thatch for looking into some low-level USB host stuff that is related to some issues I filed on GitHub. Uh, echoing uh, what some other folks have said, thanks to C. Darius, uh, James J. Nadal, Retired Wizard, and also David Glauda, all for sharing and working on things uh, related to the card pewter. Uh, it's been really amazing to see the capabilities for CircuitPython on it uh, evolve so quickly. Um, thanks to Dan and all the contributors who contributed anything to 9.0 uh, for the new release candidate coming out. On uh, GitHub user, thanks to Pink, uh, Pinkava J uh, on GitHub for submitting several improvements to the WizNet 5K library over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and finally, thanks to DigiDevin3 and Anecdata for updating and adding examples in requests and NTP libraries for the new connection manager. Thanks. I need to look at that NTP example. All right, just is, Justin is on deck, but Jerry, you're up now. Hey, thanks. Yeah, it's a group hug, and thanks, everybody, for everything you do. Good to see you as well. All right, uh, Justin and then Liz. Yeah, just a quick hug for both Dan and Anecdata for trying to help me uh, work through an M4 matrix uh, project I have at home. Um, Google changed their SSL cert, and I spent most of the week trying to see if I get that to work again. And I've now shoved that off to the side and had to um, use a feather wing um, and an S3 to actually get this project back up and going. Thank you. Um, Liz and then Melissa. Hello. Uh, so, hug to Melissa for reviewing my PR to the HT16K33 Circuit Python library and a group hug. Thank you. And Maker Melissa, then I have some notes to read. I just had a group hug for everyone. And then... All right. Good to see you as well. I've got notes, notes from Retired Wizard to read, and then we will round out the section by hearing from Scott. A uh, retired wizard writes, a hug to Foamy Guy for his M5 stack card pewter streams. A hug to uh, David Glode for working on the card pewter key number mappings for C. Darius's DMUX key matrix PR. And a late hug for C. Darius and James J. Nadeau for their original work on card pewter PRs. One for Sean the IT Guy for re-sparking my interest in the cheap yellow display devices. And a last one for everyone at Adafruit for great products and fostering this great community. You want to play us out, Scott? Yeah, happy to. Uh, I have a quick hug for Penguinist 
uh, for testing CircuitPython on the H2 and discovering that it was no longer working and filing an issue. Which we fixed, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. good. All right. Well, it was great hearing uh, what you looked around the community and saw that was going on. Uh, but now we are going to do status updates, which is the time for you to tell us what you are up to. So take a few moments and let us know what you've been doing during the last week or since the last time we had a chance to catch up and what you'll be working on in the next week or in the near future. I'll start and then we'll go down the uh, notes document like just like we did for Hug Reports and give everybody a chance. So next up after me will be Dan. Uh, but for now, I just want to uh, fess up that I haven't been working on CircuitPython much. My main work is still on the Adafruit Floppy library, which works with Arduino. But this will eventually tie back to CircuitPython um, because we've improved how MFM decoding works and we've got some other changes in there and we'll bring those in via a submodule and improve uh, how some of these things work, particularly on the RP2040, which is the microcontroller that is on the upcoming Flopsy product. Um, a wrinkle is that I updated MFM decoding so that it uh, works by storing the entire track in flux form. Uh, and this is kind of a challenge to make work uh, in CircuitPython without an incompatible API change. I'll try, but uh, just be aware that that, uh, that may be coming down the road if I can't deal with some uh, memory allocation issues. And yeah, that's what I'm working on. It will be floppy for the foreseeable future. I feel like um, a thing that I hope to get back to is there's a PR that I have out there that is close to the finish line and it is about enabling SSL on uh, the WizNet Ethernet boards. And um, just as soon as I can get time to work on that, that is something I will be getting back to. Uh, but now, enough excuses about uh, why I didn't get a lot done. Uh, let's hear from Dan and then DJ Devin 3. All right. So last Thursday, I uh, released CircuitPython 9.0 Least Candidate 1 after Release Candidate 0. And um, there's just been one fix since then, which is just a typo and a pin name. There's no reason to have an RC2 for such a fix. So you're talking about maybe releasing 9.0 final, maybe today or tomorrow, we'll discuss it in In the Weeds. So hold on to your hats. Okay. That's very cool, Dan. I'm so looking forward to that release. All right, uh, we have DJ Devin 3, and then I have some notes to read. Uh, thank you. Uh, this week I made some progress investigating a bug with the Adafruit ATEX 608 crypto module. The serial number gets randomly truncated, which causes the ensuing certificate process to fail with the CRC mismatch error. Uh, I originally picked up this project because someone was having an issue with the chip in the Discord and just wanted some help, and I was like, yeah, sure, I'll give it a shot. Little did I know there's a three-year-old bug report on it uh, with the same issue, so I'm not sure if this has worked in three years. Um, but I was able to get it to create a public certificate with all zeros as a serial number and that is actually progress and one of the neatest features about this chip is that it can avoid an i2c scan as part of its security uh, most people will believe that they've bricked the chip when they can no longer detect the i2c device and then just give up uh, especially since it does have a bug in circuit python that makes it unusable currently anyway it will return the error no such device and you must send it a specific frequency ping to wake it up and then you can access the i2c address it's a sneaky little chip i figured that out after hundreds of iterations and refused to believe it was dead and just kept on going with the termination and figured it out by brute force um, this week i also helped discord user riven warden attempt to get rocket launch live api working on a pi portal after helping with their issue i dove straight into creating an adafruit request example with connection manager and that should make a nice addition to the API examples. And after getting my feet wet with uh, Connection Manager and Adafruit Requests, I dove straight into updating all of the Adafruit Request API examples with Connection Manager. And I almost got all of them done in a weekend. I got 11 out of 12 done. Currently working on Twitter, which has changed their API, obviously, as everyone knows, uh, to be more like Fitbits. So as long as you have an idea of like how Fitbit 
uh, Google API works, then you should be able to, um, you know, refactor all of your previous OAuth 1 scripts from Twitter to work with the new Twitter. So that's what I'll be working on today and tomorrow is getting that done. And I'm sure I'll be able to get it done. So that's what I've been doing. Is it? That is a lot. Thank you. I'll read notes from David and then we'll go to Foamy Guy. David writes, uh, M5 Stack Card Computer Week. Discovered the M5 Stack Card Computer thanks to Foamy Guy Streams and ordered one. Created the board description for CircuitPython org. Tested the multiplexed key matrix keyboard contribution using an artifact. And created the key ID to USB HID key code matrix for the card pewter keyboard. And in the notes document, there is a link to a GitHub guest, uh, or gist if you pronounce it that way, for uh, that code. And next up, we've got Foamy Guy and then Jerry. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, last week, I uh, cleaned up some code and finally submitted a PR for an outlined label class. I actually created a while ago, but ended up setting down. Uh, and getting distracted by other stuff for a while. Um, so it was nice to actually get that finished up and submitted. It extends bitmap label, so it basically works the same as bitmap label, but it gives you additional settings for the color and stroke size of an outline. Um, it uses a bunch of blit operations, like one per pixel of your uh, font bitmap. So I don't think it's terribly efficient, but I did test it on some small and medium sized fonts and they still rendered pretty much instantly. So uh, I think as long as you don't go too giant, it should be okay. Um, I started trying to use bitmap labels, uh, the bitmap on them specifically as the overlay in the Pi camera library. Um, it sort of works, it lets you do it, it doesn't crash, but the resulting photo doesn't look right, the label colors and location are wrong. I think I need to dive uh, back into color spaces to figure out um, what's up with the colors and then um, also figure out where what went wrong with the location. Um, but I will get back to that, I think, later on this week. Um, I kept working on this card pewter messenger server app that I started uh, last week or the week before. It's coming along pretty nicely. I have it now to where messaging works correctly, uh, both sending and receiving from the handset to the web page back and forth. Uh, and I also have a little basic menu built out now that uses page layout to swap between four different screens. Um, the next steps that I have in mind for it are implementing a conversation screen to be able to look back through the history of a conversation, uh, adding some control number shortcuts. Right now you have to go back to the menu in order to go to a different page. I think it'd be nice to just jump from page to page with control number. Um, uh, and then uh, adding after that is uh, trying to add public key cryptography for the messages that get sent across the network and uh, some other kind of encryption AES perhaps for the data that is stored on the SD card uh, and then one that I tacked on at the end late uh, but I also intend to do is update it to work with the newer demuxed keypad uh, module from the core. A um, couple other things that I have in mind to get started on this week is uh, uh, working on a Simon style game that will use arcade buttons and a Grove uh, Featherwing uh, for easy solderless connections, although I got to solder to the buttons anyway. Um, uh, that will be the second in my sort of line of cardboard arcade games, uh, so I'm excited about that. I have been reviewing library PRs uh, today, uh, so far started with NTP requests and WizNet, but I have a couple others lined up after those. Um, and then uh, outside of CircuitPython uh, for the week, I've been trying to design and 3D print some parts that can be used with cabinet locks to make a, a physical sort of safe-like box that can be used to demonstrate the fundamental concepts of public key cryptography, uh, especially for folks who kind of um, are tangible or visual learners. I think it'll be a, a neat assistant for that. So uh, that's what I have been up to. Thanks. Cool idea using cabinet locks within your 3D print. I, I would love to see some pictures of that when it is done. Um, but now we have Jerry and then Justin. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've been experimenting with async I.O. Um, lots to learn, but trying to incorporate that into the RFM 9x69 combined library. Um, and um, having some good results and still trying to convince myself that it actually helps but uh so far it's 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 working but uh, lots again lots to learn um and also playing a lot with the ov 5640 cameras and one of the things I, I meant to do a while ago and never got around to it was to play with manually focusing the autofocus module so that's that's back on track now 
hopefully get that this week. And um, oh yeah, I made my first PC board actually a couple of weeks ago, but I've been using it quite a bit now. So that was a, a, a big breakthrough for me to actually make one. It's just a crude adapter to connect the OB5640 boards to a feather, so a little OB feather wing. And um, I was having a lot of problems when I tried to try to use jumper wires. The long wires were, were causing some problems with the with the with the board with, with the cameras. So uh, I put a link into my my board. Um, it's crude. <laughs> um, it was a, just a cut and paste uh, from a, a, a feather proto board. Um, I probably should have spent a lot more time on the silk screen, um, but I just wanted something to try, and it, it works. So having fun with that. All right. Thanks. Kudos for sharing your design. Thanks so much for that. Um, and yeah, the link is in the notes document. And I think that means that anybody can order uh, a couple copies of that board from Osh Park. Um, I would, I would think so. how that works. All right. Anyway, um, Justin and then Liz. Hi again. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I ended up spending a lot of my circuit pot, circuit dev time trying to work on a personal project. Um, and thanks to all those people that tried to help me see if we get the ESP32 spy um, working with Google. Still not at this point, so we'll probably bring that back up again at some point. Um, but since I was on Discord a lot um, because of that, I really focused on trying to help out as many people as I could this week. So um, always feels good to get someone um, past a hump at whatever they're trying to work on. Cool, thanks. All right, we have Liz and then Melissa. Okay, I added a quick fix to the HT16K33 library for the bi-color 8x8 matrices. Previously, when you would call shift, the colors would flip-flop, so red would turn green, green would turn red. Uh, the culprit was a misplaced bit, and I was looking into this because I'd like to try coding up a snake game at some point with one of these matrices. Uh, and then for project work, I wrote some code to control an Elgato key light with an ESP32S3 reverse TFT with CircuitPython. Uh, the code sends HTTP requests via the Elgato API. This will be a learn guide, should be out later this week. And I'm also working on quick learn guides for the new Pi Cowbells are in the shop. There's one with uh, just a 2x20 headers, and there's one with terminal blocks, and there's a doubler that also has battery support. So I think folks will like using those for their projects. And that's what I've been working on. Thank you. All right, we have Melissa. Whoops. We have Melissa, and then Scott again will round out this section. Hello, so I fixed a bug in the CircuitPython code editor that wasn't allowing folders to be downloaded. Finished my learn guide uh, for using web workflow with the Pi camera, and I added uh, some new boards to circuitpython.org. I worked on um, going through learn guide feedback, and I worked on trying to figure out a big issue with some code uh, that displays the Wayland desktop on the Snake Eyes bonnet displays. And uh, so I'll just I'm just going to kind of continue on that same stuff. Thank you. And now, with a last minute update, we are ready for Scott. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I forgot to say that I fixed an issue with CircuitPython 9 on the ESP32H2. Um, our NeoPixel was crashing, and this is the, the bug I was referring to from uh, Penguinist. Um, yep, we were clocking. Clocking the RMT for the NeoPixels at the rate that the H2 couldn't do, so I, I fixed that. Um, I spent a lot of time last week looking at Honcho, which is a build system uh, that's all Python. It's really interesting. I did a lot of work trying to get CircuitPython moved over. I'm still working on that in the background, but um, it can't be my top priority because it's just, it's a lot of work. Um, the CircuitPython build system is quite complicated. Um, so... It's interesting, and I want to kind of keep along uh, with what, what Austin, the author of Honcho, is doing. Uh, but it's not going to be my primary focus going forwards. Um, what I am looking to do is uh, work on USB host Featherwing support. This is something that is a long time coming because the, the Featherwing itself came out in the fall, I think. Um, but, you know, because I was busy, didn't have a chance to, to do it. So um, Tiny USB has support, so... It, Hopefully it won't be too hard, um, but I'm planning on uh, picking that up this week. And then any other 9.0 urgent bugs that come up, um, I will I will be interrupted by and, and get those fixed. And then after USB host feathering stuff is checked in, I want to update the IDF to 5.2.1. Uh, 
uh, which just came out um, because I kind of am planning to do ESP BLE support after that. And I just want to start with like the latest, the latest stable IDF for that one. And that will be kind of like part of nine point, uh, CircuitPython 9.1 probably will be, uh, include the IDF 5.2 update uh, with it. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Thanks, Scott. I'm really interested in having a chance to use the USB host Featherwing. I think it would be really, it would be really cool uh, just for making all-in-one style devices. If it, um, especially if it works on the RP2040 with the DVI Featherwing. Um, but anyway, all right, uh, that rounds out status updates, and we do have a couple of items for in the weeds. Uh, this is the opportunity opportunity for long form discussions mostly what people have identified ahead of time, although sometimes it can come out of things that we talk about during status updates. And once again, I will just take these in uh, document order. So uh, we're going to talk to Foamy Guy, and then to Tyeth, and then to Scott. Uh, so take it away, Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, I just wanted to chat about uh, iSort. Um, there's an open PR in the cookie cutter repo where there was a little bit of discussion a week or two ago uh, about this. It's basically a, a proposal for adding a new step to pre-commit that runs this iSort um, tool on the code, which can change um, the order that the imports are in. Um, generally, or I should say more specifically, the questions in my mind are um, how do we want to like nuts and bolts, how do we actually want to make the change to the libraries? Do we want to do a PR for every repo? Um, or do we want to, is it like, okay, just to do direct commits to main? Um, and then my assumption would be that we would do like a release sweep after that with Adabot. Um, is there any reason that that assumption is wrong or anything? Uh, what kind of timeline, if we do want to do that, would we want to do it over? It makes sense to me to kind of do it um, pretty soon here with 9.0, since it's like, it's not a huge change in that the functionality doesn't really change, but it is uh, a large change in the in the sense that it requires touching a lot of libraries. Um, and then uh, on the topic of touching a lot of libraries, if we were going to be doing that anyway, is there anything else that we might want to do at the same time? Um, there was a note added here by Justin, which was something that I saw as well, some talk over the weekend in Discord about uh, a configuration change to the lined endings inside of Git. Um, I know one of the other topics on the actual PR itself, too, was potentially looking at a different um, code formatter, I think, called rough, maybe, instead of black. Um, but, yeah, if anybody knows of anything else that we've talked about or that they've thought about that might be good to do um, to all the libraries, uh, if we are going to be going through them anyway, then it would be a great time to do it. So uh, those are kind of my thoughts and questions. I had a question. If if we add iSort, do you have to? Is that a change you have to make to every library? If you don't change the iSort order right away, but only when the next time the library has a PR. Or is oh, it, interesting. Like, like, could, could we add it? Doing it? Like, there's no. This change doesn't change anything except you know it doesn't improve the libraries in any way. Um, right. So if you just make it, if it's made in something that's a build tool that's not part of each repo, then only when we do, when somebody makes a PR to the library, then it will isort those things and they'll get fixed at that time. Right. So, yeah, that's a good if, thought I hadn't considered is like, if we update the pre-commit config now, but not change the... Uh, not change the actual code, although I I do think it will make the actions. Um, yeah, it will make fail the, on main. it will make GitHub show the the tip of the main branch is not building, which is not ideal. We'd like people to come and see a green check mark instead of a red X. Yeah, um, yeah I maybe. just want to chime in about rough. Um, in several mm -hmm. of my personal projects, I have switched to using rough and it replaced the use of black and iSort and Pylint, and it's faster. Um, so I thought that was really cool. I don't know, Rough is kind of opinionated, so like there are some things that it may think are, are good style in Python 3.11, 
um, that turn out not to work on CircuitPython. So I would check whether it is compatible, uh, you know, whether it produces code that still works on CircuitPython. Like I think in particular, um, it's really opinionated about using F strings and mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't fully, maybe we do fully use that now, I'm not sure. But anyway, we'd want to, I think, do some pilot checks to make sure it doesn't mess things up in, an, in a CircuitPython incompatible way. But it's yeah. one tool instead of three, and it's faster, which doesn't make a big difference, but over time it, it can make a, yeah. a cumulative difference. Um, but yep. we would also have to like reformat a bunch of our libraries because it's slightly different than PyLint and what it wants and so forth. Right. Yeah, which we would be doing with the iSort anyway, although rough, it may make more substantial changes, um, certainly. Um, that is cool, though, that it replaces the other three. I did not realize that it was not just the formatter like black. I am actually, um, that sounds pretty good to me to replace the three of those with one, one thing personally. Have you found in your usage of it um, that it's like, relatively configurable kind of like black so like theoretically if there are things where it produces code that is incompatible we could maybe configure it to skip those checks or is it pretty rigid uh, or do you not know necessarily um, i don't want to commit to anything while i can't like pull up information in the okay. middle of this uh gotcha. in the middle of this thing but uh my my impression is like pilot is super configurable you can turn on and off each individual warning and mm -hmm black as a code formatting tool it has only a few things that you can adjust and i believe that rough goes more toward the black end of things where we have one way that people should do it rather than the okay. configurable way but i would have to check on that because i didn't i didn't actually tune any of those things for my projects i just made my project fit with what rough um okay. required I i'll try rough, rough lets you turn off things like oh there are too many variables and stuff Okay. MicroPython switched to Rough a number of months ago and didn't have much trouble. Oh, that That's... is a really good data point, Dan. Yeah. So, uh, also, by the way, F strings are turned on for everything. So nice. There's no, there are no builds without F strings. So, I think that using the model of what MicroPython did, and we might even look at their Rough settings, yeah. is probably the way to go mm -hmm. because that will make it up compatible with upstream in various yeah. ways okay i will dig around a little bit and see if i can find their settings and then start applying it just locally to libraries and kind of see what shakes out as far as changes and i'll get those those modified libraries onto devices make sure everything is still running there and i'll report back on that thread um how everything goes but um all of this sounds positive to me so i would say i'm you know pending the outcome of that kind of stuff i would say i'm relatively in favor of uh of changing over yeah i'd switch to rough with our micropython update but if we want to do it sooner that's fine too okay yeah and it can always be separate uh on the core in the libraries as well so if we do swap the libraries in cookie cutter now um, it sounds like whenever micropython gets merged in again we may just pick it up automatically depending on how it's set up but uh, in the core that is I have some usability opinions on this uh, after you know the 12 PRs that I've been going through this weekend and there's been a big change in how I used to submit things and now the new way that I have to do it um, I've never had a problem with black like I would just run black and then submit and it worked every time now I run black and then I have to run pilot and then I have to you know try and get iSort you know, all sorted out the way that it wants. And then I have to do pilot manually and then figure out the pilot issues. And pilot, I think, <clears throat> as, as mentioned, has actually become much more strict with requiring F strings for things that it never required before. Like I have a date time formatter, uh, you know, struct formatting time. That's always been, um, it's always used the dot format, you know, whatever, whatever the regular Python dot format now it required me to change it to f strings so i had a lot of changes to make this weekend it wasn't just you know the regular stuff i it was forcing me to use f strings for everything yeah um, yeah it's so that's just i think like, i mean i think that those kinds of frustrations i think will probably just pop up naturally no matter which system we go forward with it whether it's pilot or rough just as they update their like quote unquote what is correct um 
in in their system as they make changes, then it's like old code on our side will have to change to make it happy. Um, one thing I would mention though, it sounds like you're doing all of them separately. Pre-commit is really the tool that's designed to solve that particular problem. I think it sounds like, um, I didn't follow yeah, everything, but it sounds like issues. you have trouble getting yeah. pre-commit running. If I were you, I would be working towards trying to figure out how to get um, maybe like a separate instance of Git for Windows installed, uh, separate from your desktop one, um, and yeah. trying to figure out how to get pre pre-commit running, because that pre-commit will basically do all of those things for you. And as far as I understand it with iSort, it should also behave like Black does in that when you run pre-commit, it makes the changes for you. So if if you run it the first time and it fails and then you just run it immediately again, it should succeed because it made the changes for you. Yeah, something's um, got to be messed up because nothing like Black, Black will format for me, but Pylint does not. Yeah, no, Pylint, Pylint won't. Not. Right, that's expected, yeah. And because Pylint can't really, because there's not... Right, but if I, I mean, run it... pre-commit, Pylint fails. So I have to run Pylint manually to figure out where Pylint is failing and then run, you know, it, it's this... It's Print a for you. Yeah, when you when you run pre-commit, if it fails for Pylint, it should tell you, it should print out, like, failed for Pylint on this line for this reason. Yeah, it's all line ending, like a thousand, two thousand line ending errors. I see. Okay. Well, that's, so that's, that's a different issue. That's your next. That's your next issue, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. And I appreciate all the help that everyone's been giving me. There's, yeah, I, I'm not ignoring your advice. It's just I got issues. Right. Uh, yeah. And you were talking about running Pilot manually, and I believe when uh, when pre-commit runs Pilot in a cookie cuttered repo, it passes some flags that are defined in the pre commit config.yaml file and I'm pretty sure one of those is to turn off this particular diagnostic about f strings. So if you are not running it with the same flags and if you're not of course running the same version of pylint, those are two reasons that your pylint would be more exacting than the real one. Um, but I also think that kind of debugging your git setup is not um, what we need to do right now. So if you're content, right, I think we can move on from that. Um, the versions that I'm running, I checked from the YAML on the on the repo and made sure that all of my versions are exactly the same. In fact, I had to downgrade iSort from like something in order to get that to, to function on the same way that it, the, the repo wants it. So I had to do a lot of customizations and it thinks, yeah, yeah that's, that's just, maybe it's just me. No, but there's also Pylon RC. There are initializations that are different for the libraries. So if you just run it without the initialization files, you'll get in trouble. Yeah, so, after all these PRs, I'm probably just going to wipe everything and just re-fork everything. Yeah, I end up re-cloning re stuff a bunch as well uh, to fix issues when I get tired of fighting with Git. So I can definitely uh, um, relate to that. Um, in terms of swapping, so it sounds like we'll, we'll check out Ruff, and it sounds like Ruff actually does the same thing that iSort does in addition to some other stuff. So if we did want to adopt Rust, then effectively we would not really adopt iSort. Is that a correct understanding on my port? I believe so. Right, it's all it's all in one, so yeah. Okay, so I will check that out and um, leave some, leave like what I find in a comment on that uh, PR. I would still be interested if we do uh, look to do that. Is there any opinions on like how mechanically we do it, like PRs or direct commits? Um, Justin, I see you're offering to help in the GitHub. I definitely appreciate that. Um, do we like how how do we uh, think about moving forward with that? Either PR each of the libraries and then run through and do all the reviews and everything, or um, just make the commits directly, try to figure out some way. I don't think the the uh, Adabot patch tool, I don't think necessarily can work for this because it, it can really only um, modify files that are the same across all the repos, like the files that exist in cookie cutter essentially. Whereas either iSort or Ruff, either one, it's gonna end up making changes to the code files, which obviously are different in each repo. So um, I don't, know that there's a way to automate it with Adabot, but there could be a way to automate it with some other tool if we're okay with that and then just committing to main. But uh, I wanted to get thoughts on that.
I'm happy with any automatically performed fixes to just go directly to main. I would review some of them, uh, you know, but I wouldn't necessarily go through the pull request process. Okay. Yeah, we've done that before when they were massive, when there was a something all the libraries. We, mm. Yeah, and there's a mechanism in ABOT to do that. So, oh, okay, I'll have to dig around further. I think there is, yeah. Okay. All right. I will. I think uh, that that covers that um, weeds topic. Then I'll uh, I'll check out rough and leave some comments there, and we'll go from there. Well, there was some question about line endings, but I don't know if we really. Oh. Need yeah, that's a good. Good call. Yeah, if there's any, I mean, generally speaking, any kind of configurations we would want to change, be it. Um, pre-commit or git or, or anything else the line ending ones um definitely amongst them i would say i don't necessarily have much to add to the specifics of that choice because i don't fully understand it when i was using git on windows i just took the default whatever it tells you in the installer um is the default and then since then i've switched to linux and it doesn't ask you or it's different or what, why do we see what understand. rough does with line endings because maybe it does something clever uh yeah and, that's a good point too yeah and, especially if it's oh my God, i think the goal would be to make sure that it doesn't matter and nothing fails when you right. run linting locally but then it always commits with just plain line feeds like that's the that's the problem right now is that um The linting requires line feeds, but then depending on how you check it out, if you're checking on Windows, it changes, it defaults to control line feeds, so then the linting fails. So we can either do that, get attributes to fix that, or potentially depending on rough says. So. Right, or, or people who are using Windows can also make, not just get attributes, but they can change it a global that force. It's, it mainly is an issue about their their editors, whether their editors are, can deal with bare line feeds or not. I'll try to test on Windows as well. I do have access yeah. to a Windows machine, so I'll try to run through the same process of like um, running rough on a library and seeing what it spits out. All right, so I'm done. I, I've, I've exhausted my ideas about line feeds. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, I agree with Justin. The key is to make sure that uh, a DOS format file is not committed. Um, but if somebody has a DOS format working file, that's different, and that should be fine if we can make it fine. Um, but yeah, we don't want people, you know, I opened it in my editor and it changed every line, and then I opened it in, she opened it in her editor and it changed every line, and that's just not a good road to go down. Um, does anybody know what Walkwe is? Uh, just moving on to the next item, because if you do, I'd love for you to read Tyeth's thing instead of me, because I don't know yeah. what yeah. it is. I guess I do. Yeah, um, yeah, I know what it is. I've used it a couple of times. I can't say I have super in-depth knowledge, but uh, Walkwe, it's like a, um, I don't know if emulator is the exact correct term, so I apologize if I'm misusing the term emulator, technically speaking, but it's basically an emulator for microcontrollers, the one uh, that they had back when I used it was the Raspberry Pi Pico. So it uh, runs in your computer, like I think it was in the browser. You load up a web page, you know, kind of like code.circuitpython.com or whatever when you're coding your CircuitPython device, except there's no device. The device is actually emulated. Um, and you can run MicroPython and CircuitPython code. And I think they have some Arduino stuff as well, although I was less interested in that side, so I don't know for sure. Um, Tyeth says about it here, uh, has USB host support. It was a bit less functional than hoped. Uh, MSC, this was a 9.1 thing or likely to squeeze into 9.0. Uh, I'm not sure if this question is about... That's not the one about one one specifically. Okay. I gotcha. Um, um, should I just answer that? So uh, I think they ran into issues with the library. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a CircuitPython core issue. It's... The problem is that like all of the class support is done from Python for USB host, except for um, except for keyboards right now. Um, so 
I, uh, I it, it's not right to think that it's a, a 9.0 or 9.1 thing because it's more of a more of a library issue than a core issue as far as I can tell. Um, we are trying to circle back to it. You know, the USB Featherwing stuff will probably have the same issue. Um, yeah, it, it also depends on our prioritization for learn guides and things. Uh, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's a core issue from what I remember when I, when I saw it. Cool. Uh, couple other things mentioned here on the Wakwi front. Uh, Tyth did some testing on 9.0 uh, RC1 on Wakwi this weekend uh, using the online virtual simulator via CI testing. Uh, ESP32 went into safe mode, possibly simulator related. The uh, S2 and S3 worked well. The C3 had simulation uh, error being fixed by Yurish. Uh, there's a link here probably to a GitHub issue or something like that, I'm guessing. Um, C6 and H2 to come. Uh, give Wakwi a try if you haven't already. And if you want to test CI, then ping me for an API token you can use. Uh, so yeah, that sounds really cool. Actually, I totally did not realize. I'm assuming S2, S3, I'm assuming these are all um, you know, ESP32 variants. So it sounds like since the last time I looked at this, they have added a, uh, a whole new port because I think it was RP2040 uh, to the best of my recollection. So that's really cool to see that they've got some new devices. Um, I can say I, for one, am definitely uh, looking forward to playing around with it. You can do some really cool stuff. I think uh, I will mention is uh, is Tectric here. I think Tectric was looking into this um, a little bit, Tithe. So you might you might reach out to them and see, um, just kind of pick their brain and see see what they came up with. I don't know how far along it got, but I'm pretty sure uh, not too long ago, this was something that Tectric brought up as well, using specifically using Wakwi with CI um, in order to run tests and stuff like that against the simulators, which I also think would be really, really cool if we could get it worked out. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, Tectric's goal was to measure library size with it too. Ah, yeah. Yeah, or uh, RAM usage would be another cool one. I know we always have folks running into issues. It'd be cool to have some stats to be able to throw throw out there, hard stats right. and stuff. All right, well, I learned what Wakwi is, so this whole meeting was worth it. But let's move on to the next item, and I will just prefix this by saying yes uh, before handing it <laughs> off to <laughs> Scott to tell us what the question was. Uh, so the question is, is, are we ready for 9.0? Um, Dan's done two release candidates. Um, RC1 was done on Thursday, I think, Dan, and uh, I don't think we've seen any major issues crop up over the weekend with that. That's right. And so the only our 900 final would be the same except for this one extra commit that fit, fixes one board's a typo and a pin name. So I don't see any reason to have an RC2 I just like that. I just merged the control C thing you did too. Oh, okay. Uh, you think that's I think safe? It's fine. Yeah. Okay. I I mean let's let's also preface with this with that we fully expect to have to do nine oh one. Um and and so the sooner we get it out this week, the more time we have before we have weekend. Um so, so I can yeah. do that this I, I can basically do the release tonight. Right. This afternoon. And so, so I will maybe I'll go I'll go ahead with that. Anybody have going concerns? once? Going twice. Going three times. Shipped. And I will not um turn off the eight bundles yet. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, we don't usually turn that off until we're ready to start doing and pre-releases, I think. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a bunch of things about changing the defaults to be nine, and there's something about the screenshot generator. I have, I have a, I have a checklist in, a, in an issue. So I'll do all that stuff, and I'll make the nine fi final release and publicize it, and then we'll get plenty of things. And I will yeah. also, cl I will also branch nine. So any. 90 fixes will go into a branch. So if you see something that you want to fix in 900 and later, 
submit those PRs not to main but to the branch because that makes moving it over into main easier. Right. We we tend to merge 90x into main, not the reverse. So right. it's any fixes of... you want out before a 91 need to go in 90x. Yeah. Great. Right. Well, th thank you to Dan for running the releases and thanks to yes, everybody thank who's fixed and fixed bugs and found bugs and done all that. It's very exciting to it's been just over a year since CircuitPython 8, so this is going to be great. Yeah, I appreciate it. And also, I, we had we had a lot of bugs, and it was only a month or two ago, and we had a lot of bugs. And thanks to everybody who worked for those, especially Scott. And yeah, I, I mean, I think it's pretty easy to say that nine is better than eight at this point, too. So that's good. Yes, I agree with that. I was, yeah, I was more worried a month ago, and now I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll find something, and we'll fix it, and it'll be fine. Yeah. All right, all right. So watch for it, everybody. All right. Well, with that exciting news and just past the one hour mark, we are ready to wrap up the meeting. This has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 18th, 2024. Thank you to everybody who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, considering purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on March 25th. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. Be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody.